for joining. I feel like we just barely got to know Aquaria layer of behemoths and already here comes M21. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously a lot of things are a little uh, wonky right now, but man, uh, I'm not mad to see some new cards either, though, you know? Uh, yeah, it's weird. Um, I feel like the Aquaria layer behemoth standard is just already so developed. Like it, it's going to be exciting to have a, a gigantic wrench thrown into the mix. So, or, you know, several. Uh, yeah. And, uh, they, you know, first week of spoiler season and already, uh, I mean, th- this is like half of all spoiler season, right? Like they're only doing a two week spoiler season this time. So we've seen all kinds of stuff and a lot of it seems very high impact. Yeah. Really exciting stuff. Um, where do you want to start? Planeswalkers, Titans, uh, crazy undercosted, also Titans, the return of <laughs> Baneslayer Angel. What? All right. Well, dude. Okay. So what about the bigger, better Baneslayer Angel, Elder Gargadar- Gargaroth? Talk to me about why Elder Gargaroth, and there's another card I actually want to talk about after this, isn't a Titan. So the way that I think about this, right? So the original paradigm is Baneslayers versus Drifters, where a Baneslayer is a creature where the value is kind of in the creature itself, like questing. No, 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 no. It's not in the creature itself. No, no, it's, it's, uh, with mold drifter, the value is without the investment. You just get the value. And with a Bane Slayer, the value comes from the investment. So it doesn't matter how much is the size of the creature. And it doesn't matter how much of the value it gives you is how much it attacks for each turn versus if it draws cards. The question is, which side of the investment is the value? Sure. A, is squ- the val- a squire is a bane slayer from this paradigm, right? Exactly. So, so I, I get that. But I'm saying, look, so a questing beast is a is a bane slayer. And, totally. And so is a tarmogoyf. So I get that so far, right? Now, there's a, a, a third kind of... With the exception of, just as a note, as far as bane slayers go, questing beast, like anything with haste, has a little bit of... Uh, enters the battlefield. It's not always, it's not guaranteed, but it's not like Questing Beast is 100 0. That's sure. It. Yeah, same thing as like how, how I would count a Monastery, Swift Spear, or a Goblin Guide. Those are burn spells, right? Like they're burn spells that draw fire, but they're they're burn spells, right? Like the, right. Their, their haste gives them that. And the thing is, the triggered ability on an Idol on a Great Revel it's, is also, it's like its haste, right? Like these things are, they're not the exact same keyword, but they flow into, into each other. Uh, in a way that's useful, if not precise, right? I, I think that right. these are totally. these are common things. So when I saw Elder Gargaroth, I thought this card, uh, and so I'm very happy to to uh, just understand this point better. Is that I I saw this card as being very Titanic. So the the paradigm was Mole Drifters and Bane Slayers, and then there's Titans, right? So there's Prime. Well, Titan. Titan, yeah, a Titan would just be uh, something that both gives you uh, substantial value with no investment and then also more value from it continuing over, like it, it continues to accrue value every turn that it lives. This thing doesn't give you any value with the turn you play it. If somebody doom blades this, you have nothing. So I a million percent agree with that, right? So the this obviously falls on the, Baneslayer Angel line of Just Dice to Doomblade if it gets Doombladed immediately. But I don't think it is quite as bad as that, only because it's got a little bit, it's not quite Titan, it doesn't have the, enters the battlefield, but it's attacks or blocks, right? That's the but only Bane thing. But Baneslayer Angel has that too. If Baneslayer Angel blocks, it gains five life. All right. That's the same thing. Yeah, it's just, you're, it doesn't have to just be Doomblade. Your opponent could just bounce this, right? Or they could steal it, or they could sweep the board. Anything they do, that it blocks is something, but it's even less than having haste. And likewise, I mean, Bane Slayer Angel could block the turn you play it and gain five life. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it's very versatile. It's nice that it accrues options for you on your own turn, and it has the potential to do it twice where you're continuing to attack and get some sort of value that is meaningful to you whether you need the life to race if you just want extra cards against somebody that's playing with removal if you want extra beasts so that you can stabilize the board and and the fact that you can attack and block with it in a way that bane slayer angel is not as effective 
I mean, this car looks fantastic, but it is still all investment. You lose everything if it dies. Yeah, I, I, you don't, I think it's a timing thing, right? You don't lose everything if it dies after it's done some stuff, right? Well, or no, maybe no, I'm not no, no, understanding no. something. Okay, so if you play an Ophidian yeah. and it just dies, you get nothing, right? Like if your opponent just incinerates the Ophidian, you have nothing to show for it. Even if the Ophidian hits your opponent for three turns and you have all those extra cards, even if it dies, you didn't get those cards without investment. You protected Ophidian for three turns. The value came from protecting your investment. The value came from an investment that paid off. Whereas if uh, somebody kills your Mold Drifter, but you just cast Mold Drifter and then they kill it, you still have all of the cards. You have the cards even though your opponent killed the Mold Drifter. Sure. Uh, sure. And the same a, would be true even if Mold Drifter... awesome. And Doomblading a Mold Drifter, you can't do it too many times. You're just going to run out of cards. Yeah, and Primeval Titan is different. See, like a Mold Drifter that was a 6-6 six, six would still just be a Mold Drifter because it's not about the size of the body. Uh, but a, a Mold Drifter that also draws two cards every turn in addition to two cards when you play it, then it would be a Titan because you've both gotten the value above the Doomblade guy on the way in. And every turn, for instance, Uro, you know, like Uro, or something Uros. like that, you get, Titans you get right value on the way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I don't you think value Titan, on the way Titan of uh, Nature's Red is up for much debate. Right, right. And so actually there's another Titan in this set, Massacre Worm. So Massacre Worm is a 6-5 that when it enters the battlefield, creatures your opponent control get minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. And it also has whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, uh, that player loses 2 life. So this is a reprint, but it's very powerful both. When you play it, you have this enters the battlefield ability that uh, gives you a substantial amount of value regardless of whether they kill the Massacre Worm. And it's hella and then well. And then while the Massacre Worm is in play, not only is it a big, you know, a 6-5, uh, it also has this uh, this other ability that, depending on the matchup, could be considered worth cards. It depends on if you're in a situation in which the extra damage matters or not. It's not the same as extra material, but if the format is such that uh, this is accruing more advantage for you as the game goes on, you know, that's that's the idea. Sure. Um, uh, so let's just talk about the merits of Elder Gargaroth for a second. I think this card is very good and very exciting, <laughs> yeah. but I think that it's good in, in a lane, right? So I think it's not like a primeval Titan. Primeval Titan pretty much is going to be rocking and rolling in almost every matchup where it resolves, right? But I think Elder Gargaroth is awesome against like fair creature decks and your mileage is going to vary a lot if you're playing against cards like... Karuga, Yorion, um, or... Well, who's th who's this... Let's say you're playing green-white. Yeah. Uh, who is this worse against than Baneslayer Angel? Who is it worse against the Baneslayer... Uh, let me... Th I think, like... I think... I, I want to say a red burn deck, but not even necessarily because of that ability to gain three life on the first block. So... Plus, burn can sometimes do five, but not six. Yeah. It depends on the other cards that are around, but I think like it, it, there there are going to be cases where people are going to be trying to beat you with um, either big burn spells or like combinations of non combat damage that you know five is just more meaningful than three. I think that that that's going to come up uh, where Bane Slayer Angel might might be more valuable. I think there's also going to be situations where look trample is I think the most underrated keyword has been for forever, but, uh, you know, flying does outdo trample in some situations. Obviously, trample outdoes flying in some situations also, but... Uh, yeah, but, I mean, vigilant sure outdoes first strike, right? Oh, my gosh. I mean, this card is... This card is, like, a really, really good Sarah Angel, right? I think, like, Baneslayer Angel is also very Sarah Angel reminiscent, but just d does some different stuff. But this card is, you know... It, it just kind of does everything Sarah did. Uh, I guess uh, is moat global like you can't attack if you have a right. Ally? Yeah, so it, that I guess it fails Sarah Angel's uh, original 
See, this spot, just, but doesn't this just look so much like uh, uh, Bane Slayer Angel and Uro had a kid? Uh, it does. I mean, two of its three abilities are very reminiscent of Uro. Totally. And it's not like the body hurts the comparison. No, no. It's got Uro's body, Bane Slayer Angel's casting cost, a lot of Uro's abilities. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Maybe like Uncle Garouk was hanging out uh, with that 3-3 Beast ability. I, I, anyway, I think this card is going to be fantastic. Like against Red Aggro or um, any kind of, like I think like any of these just white-based beatdown decks, black-based beatdown decks uh, that are generally removal poor, uh, I think this this card is going to be fantastic. And it's just going to be swill against uh, the, the big control decks, though. No, I don't know. See, that's the thing. I think you're going to end up in spots sometimes. There's plenty of metagames where people just end up not playing that much removal. And it's not like every removal spell ever always kills this guy. Well, I Somet- guess sometimes it's, as, as it's currently as it's currently conceived, um, there are, you know, the Yorion decks right now don't have removal that's particularly appropriate to this, right? I mean, they do have cards like Shatter the Sky, but, uh, you know, they're not Doomblading. They're, they're more like you know, fire prophesying. And even, you know, setting aside the fact that this lives through Deafening Clarion or the Fire Prophecy or any of that, uh, even if they shatter the sky, it's not you're not drawing a card. <laughs> like, that's something. Oh, that is true. So uh I think this card's gonna be good. There was a card I, I also think is is kind of Titanic, uh other than Massacre Worm. Maybe maybe I I have this have this off. Uh have you read Chandra's Incinerator? Yeah. So the first card it reminded me of was your old saw, Gurmag Angler. I feel like this is like Gurmag Angler for a burn deck. <laughs> yeah, but this isn't this isn't a Bane Slayer at all. I'm sorry, this isn't a Muldrifter at all. This is all the value comes from it staying in play. Like it, just because it does stuff doesn't mean it does anything when you play it. If your opponent Doom Blades this, you have nothing. I guess I was thinking like, I mean, maybe this is just a a wrong way of thinking about it. I was guess I was thinking like if they Doomblade this and then you respond with burn spells, you certainly get a substantial, uh, you get a substantial return. But that is contingent on the while the incinerator is in play, even if it's in play during this course of this stack. Right. Right. And this is a this isn't a one mana card. This is a six mana card. You're talking about needing a lot of mana in order to be able to do this. Oh, I see. I think that there's going to be a crop of decks that that try to try to play this. And I think a lot of the same places that today. Uh, what's the name of that big prowess guy that you discard your hand? Um, the eight drop. <laughs> that guy. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that this card is is highly appropriate to any of these maniacs who, I mean, Raptor played that guy in his uh, in in his burn deck when he when he was performing in the mocks a few years ago, and I I think I watched Reed playing that that in uh, in a prowess deck this week. So I think this card you're you're going to be situations where you're like first turn seal of fire, turn two sacrifice seal of fire, skewer the critics, you Chandra's incinerator, and then it's just going to be there, and then. Um, I, I guess it's a I guess it's a Baneslayer situation where if they Doombladed immediately, they got a good return on a Doomblade, which was two mana for a six uh six six. And if they don't, uh, you're probably just gonna kill them, right? Because you know, if you've got three cards in your hand, they are gonna lose a lot of life to this. And they've already done five. So um uh I think this card is might be really inconsistent for like modern burn decks, and I think that there are going to be some decks that that do some damage to Chandra's Incinerator. It felt very Titanic to me, but I, I can see where you're coming from on the on the Bane Slayer angle. So uh, the uh, the Incinerator, it looks like that's uh, man. It's so weird to me how much the Incinerator kind of looks like Gadrek, the Crown Scourge. But uh, the Incinerator is an elemental. The Crown Scourge is a dragon. But this is a weird dragon, right? Like, yeah. how does this break you for uh, some sort of uh, I mean, maybe it's not even burn. Maybe it's more affinity. But it's two and a red for a 5-4 flyer that uh, it's a legend. And um, you can't attack unless you control four or more artifacts. And at the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token 
for each non-token creature that died this turn. And that's from either your opponent's or your side of the table. Yeah, this card seems very, very interesting to me. So it's it's super, like, not obvious how you would play this. Like, you just don't, like... You just don't just slap this into a dragon deck, right? If you don't have artifacts, it can't attack. But that said... Well, it can from if four creatures die. Um, sure. Because you get the tre- the treasure counts as artifacts. Yes. Uh, the, but you got to jump through some hoops to get there. The one thing oh, yeah. I point out is this is a 5-4 blocker for three, so it's not nothing. Um, even if you even if you can't attack with it immediately. But I mean, I think that... look. If you're in the neighborhood for actually tapping three mana, this might be a nice card in an affinity deck. And I think, like, you can just chain some cool combos uh, in terms of, like, creatures dying or even sacrificing creatures or sacrificing creature-ish, artifact-ish stuff to get treasures to get a bunch of power over the course of time with uh, cards like, um, you know, Arcbound Ravager. I think I think that that's a potentially exciting line. Um I don't know. I, I think, like, this is not a card that you can just slap into a lot of decks, and it's going to have very much text, though. So what about, like, a blue-red in Soul Artifact deck in, uh, like in, in Pioneer? Uh, Pioneer, yeah. Are you going to have four artifacts on a, on a super regular basis? That's, that's going to be the question. Well, no, you don't need four. You just need to have a combination of four between your artifacts and your creatures that die... Well, this guy's in play. Um, also, it's, you just don't want to count on that at all, do you? I I think like it's a little expensive for a blue, red, and soul artifact deck. I mean, not terminally expensive, but a little expensive. And the thing that I'm really more worried about is that deck is one of the decks in Pioneer that's really, really, really like it's got pedal to the floor. It needs to make some stuff happen. It. It is really fantastic at squeezing twenty damage into a into a narrow crevice, and really bad at uh, games that get away from it. Um, and I think like the, the yeah, I think you might be creating a, a situation where it's like, all right, I just took off the equivalent of one and a half turns to deal no damage, and something better happened for me. Uh, or all right, so here's here's an alternative uh, place to put it. Let's suppose your deck has four witches ovens. Four Trail of Crumbs, four Gilded Goose. Um, you're trying to make some food, which count as artifacts. Which is oven counts as an artifact. You know, like that's you got a little bit going there, right? And if you have all the sacrifice stuff, you can actually just trigger Gadric, uh, Gadric, and get yourself some uh, some treasure. And even if you don't have four yet, maybe there's something to the fact that when you play Gadric, like for instance, let's say you. You had like a, a priest of the forgotten gods and you play Gadric on the next turn. Not only do you have an enormous board, but you get two token, uh, two treasure tokens immediately, which gives you backup mana in case you want to make a play on your opponent's turn, depending on what they do. I think that's an awesome potential place to play this. Do you, do you see that in pioneer or only in standard? You think it's probably level standard a little low for pioneer. Yeah, I think probably standard. I like that a lot, Patrick. Because I think food is a good way to try to feed. Yeah, it's a good chatter. Uh, I mean, even if you're not like a food deck, if you're just ovens, ovens uh, are artifacts themselves, and they imply more artifacts, right? You you can easily transform um, some artifacts into other artifacts. I'm sorry, some creatures rather into other artifacts, and then maybe you would uh, tune the selection of some of your creatures to just make. Gadric work better like for example maybe you would play ginger brute in that deck like ginger brute is a or bomek oh, go ahead sorry oh bomek courier is that's not in standard anymore right no, no no but in pioneer like maybe there's enough stuff like that to make a hybrid oh that would totally make sense to me i think that like an aggro cat food deck might be sweet in pioneer like you have a ton of cards that you could play for a very low amount of mana and um you know, I, I think like people are just not set up for some of the stuff those decks can do. Like the one life loss slash life gain of of the familiar is actually it's very offsetting uh, to some of the some of the configurations of dealing damage in Pioneer, right? Like 
It's it's really weird, right? You're just like, all right, block your really re- your relatively relevant creature, you know, save that damage, and then like also ting you for one, and then gain a little life. That's it's it really can help you pull away in some matchups. So I think that that might be a place. I think that if you're going couriers and ginger brutes and ovens, I mean, that's a lot of relevant artifacts already. Again, the ovens are making more artifacts. Um, I don't know. The only thing this guy's missing is haste, but it probably make him too good. <laughs> Oh. I mean, a lot of cards get a lot better if you have, if you have haste, but yeah. Um, in uh, switching colors though, for actually, no, nah, there is another red card that man, I gotta know if you're if you're uh, thinking of this uh, double deal six. It's the ten red red uh, sorcery that uh, it does six damage to 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 two uh, to two creatures and or planeswalkers, not players though. And then uh, it costs X less, where X is the total power of creatures you control. I mean, I think this card is pretty cute. Like, <laughs> I, the, the, the dramatic amount of mana discounting obviously puts us in a situation where it could be very, very relevant for some decks. I, I, I don't, like, for example, I don't see this as being a particularly compelling main deck card. But, um, you know, I think there's tons of decks that would love to play this card after sideboarding for specific matchups um you know you want to take out a now, how, or two so how much is this card to you how much is this card about uh you know you've got like an elder gargaroth and then on the next turn you play this card and you kill two big things versus uh maybe you have a pump spell and then somehow you end up in a spot where this clears the way by killing two key uh, enemies while you're also getting, you know, a big hit in from something. Yeah, I, I, in either case, I was kind of imagining this to shine in matchups where, let's say there might be Elder Gargaroths on both sides, right? So uh, this gives you something to break, a, you know, break the parity of where somebody has a really powerful permanent uh, and might not be really rich in the ability to remove your large permanence and potentially generate some tempo and give you something to do with your mana in the mid game. I, I feel like that's, it, I, I don't necessarily know how I feel about it in terms of like squeezing in damage that turn. I think that'll probably happen some of the time. Uh, but I think like it's one of those things where you have two players who are just stockpiling material and, but there's like only one or two permanents that really matter. Uh, and th- this is one of the ways that, you, that help you get ahead. Sure. Uh, so in uh, over in white, what do you think of uh, Basri's Lieutenant? Three and a white for a two, oh, sorry, three, four Vigilance, protection for multicolor. And when Basari's Lieutenant enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control, which could be itself. It could be an Urnum Jinn. And when... Right? And when Basari's lieutenant or another creature you control dies, if it had a plus one, plus one counter on it, create a 2-2 two, two white knight creature token with vigilance. Um, I mean, this thing has a lot of good stuff to go into it, but it's just not... It, a, I'm having a hard time imagining wanting to play it, right? Uh, no, what now? Not what, right? Why? Doesn't this look great? Eh, like, there... It, let me think. How do I, how do I position this? Is there a deck where I would just want to play this card straight up? That's the first thing I, that I would think. Okay, let's start by looking at that. So straight yeah. up, let's not even count the buffing some other creature. Yeah. Just straight up by itself, it's a 4-5 Vigilance that dies into a 2-2 two, two Vigilance. So that's already or like... Four. Right, and then it also is protection from multicolor, which is a big deal. Could be a big like, deal. Yes. Your opponent can't bounce it with Teferi. Yeah. But there's so many different things that multicolor, uh, being protection from multicolor matter. As we've seen from uh, the Stone Coil Serpent, protection from multicolor is a big game. And it, it can severely blunt how much impact somebody's going to get from a card like Uro, right? It doesn't stop Uro entirely, but it, it makes it so Uro is less devastating. Uh, and if you've got multicolor... Well, it- if you got gang block or something, could matter. Well, and uh, you know your opponent, like Uro, is not really a three drop. You know, very often people had to spend seven. Sure, 
Sure. So it's not like that's the comparison, right? Like what what is the other person doing against Pisari's lieutenant? Like why like would you play with a four five that draws a card for four? Four or five that draws a card for four. I think that that if that's all it is, that's it's four or five funny. vigilance. Just say it's a four or five vigilance. Draw a card for four mana. I think Three that's. To white. I, I mean, certainly you would sometimes, but I think that's pretty fringy. Really? Yeah, I think that's. Dude, you like four four flying do nothing. <laughs> I mean, I, I have liked different things at different times in my life, right? But like Umori is like it's like a good card. Which is similar to four or five for four. That's a cantrip, and it except does that other now things. you have to pay three for oh, yeah, the cantrip. It's no longer <laughs> it's no and longer the deck building restriction. Uh, but like, you know, I I feel like just straight up, your deck has got to be doing something exciting to take advantage. Of. It's just like I don't see where it lines up against things that people are doing. It, it's I I mean I guess I it's think a you great just look at the amount of weight involved. Aggro. Dude, the card's going to find a place to be involved. Its rate's too good. The rate's really, really, really good, so it'll end up finding a niche. Like, it's not about fitting into the world that used to, you know, there used to be. Plus, this isn't even counting the crazy stuff that people are going to be able to do potentially with combos, right? Like, let's just imagine, I mean, this is, you know, the only cards that do this right now are really high-powered, but maybe they'll print stuff. Maybe the site might even have them. But if you were to imagine that you had a card that let you sacrifice... Like, there are cards that let you sacrifice your creatures for no mana, right? Sure. If you had a card that lets you put a plus-one, plus-one counter on your creatures when you play them, you would be in, uh, like, you would win, right? Like, this guy doesn't only trigger on non-token deaths. So like you could have the 2-2 two, two knight. Like let's say you had uh on a Fenza or whatever. You play the 2-2 two, two knight and it gets a plus one plus one counter. You sacrifice the knight, get whatever you got for sacrificing, then you'll get a knight and the knight'll come into play and it'll get a counter. So you could just co- loop whatever. Do something as many times as you want. Yeah, so I guess Bolster is a pretty good combo with Basri's Lieutenant. I mean, I think, like, if you have that kind of a setup, you're also in a very good position to win attrition battles naturally, right? Yeah, even if you just have two out of three of those pieces. Like, Uh, whatever two out of three of those you have is going to be really good for an attrition battle. Huh. So I'm just thinking, like, there are a fair number of decks, even in Pioneer, that just sideboard Stone Coil Serpent because it's so good against, you know, people who are trying to play Niv Mizzet or people who are defending themselves with the Deafening Clarion and Teferi. Bastard's Lieutenant um, kind of redoubles those efforts. Also, not for nothing, um, you know, if you've got creatures that have plus and plus encounters like Stone Coil Serpent itself, I mean, you're kind of doubling up on Bastard's Lieutenant's additional text. And I mean, if you've got eight pack of those cards this is not a legendary card you're really putting the hurt on on multicolored decks i guess uh i dude i don't know it's so i really think you're just you're really looking for the specific applications and not just how strong yeah. like how much impact does this card have on the game but do you think this card is better or like is this weaker or stronger than bane slayer angel weaker <laughs> by a right. lot then we will see we will see I mean, I, I think that Bane Slayer Angel is easy for you to understand how to use right now. And Basari's Lieutenant is going to be a little bit different. But are, are you sure that Bane Slayer Angel's rate is that much better than Basari's Lieutenant? Like, for instance, what do you like more in general? And this isn't a fair comparison, but just looking at some of the pieces. What do you like more in general? A four cost, four, five, or a five cost, five, five? I mean,. A four cost I'm four guessing five you in in the abstract is better than a five cost five. five. And now, uh, and, and in general, uh, flying lifelink versus vigilance protection from multicolor. Flying lifelink, I like better. Right. So, uh, but all that package together, uh, you know, you're already kind of close there, right? But then Basari's lieutenant, if it dies, you also get a two two vigilance. Bansley and Angel, you get nothing. So, and protection from demons and dragons in the first strike, those are not that good. 
So, Hell, you know, we could just say that Bane Star Angel's flying in for strike versus vigilance and protection for multicolor. If you get rid of Bane Slayer's lifelink, I'm guessing that you could you could at least put vigilance and protection for multicolor on the same footing as first strike. Okay, so if you get rid of Bane Slayer Angel's lifelink, I'm probably going to change my vote. So, well, no, 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 like, but 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 how does that compare to Basari Lieutenant's uh, the death trigger part here, where if Basari Lieutenant dies, you get a 2-2 knight. And if any of your other creatures with plus one, plus one counters, if any of them ever die, you also get a 2-2 knight. That ability has to be at least comparable to, to lifelink. Ugh. I don't know. Right? Like You're out of your mind. So Well, let's circle back to this. Like, there's just tons of situations where somebody's just like, all right, there's this really cool ability on the lieutenant, and they just chump block you and don't ever kill the lieutenant, and the lieutenant just never did anything. But Yeah, like, and there's lots of times where they didn't play the Baneslayer Angel so, and never did anything, so what? So the thing is, like, I mean, every card, regardless of the rate of the card, every card requires some context, and that... In some contexts, the card could be very good, and in other contexts, the card can be very bad, right? Like, if everybody is mono Doom Blades, yeah, Baneslayer Angel's not very good. But Baneslayer Angel, at least the first time that it that it was around, uh, existed in a context where people were playing with, you know, uh, were attacking each other with creatures, or playing, you know, landfalls, and playing wild cattles and stuff like that. And if those were the high incentive strategies, Baneslayer Angel was really good at taking over those games. If yeah, the, but that, that doesn't change the rate. You no, can still I, just I play Money Ball. At a certain point, you was, well, okay. Imagine that we're both we're both uh, you know we're we're G like we're on the team to uh, to advise the GM or we're the GMs for a, a, a sports team, and I'm trying to tell you that we should look at the analytics, and the analytics say A, B, and C, and you say yeah, but you can't know anything from the analytics. You have to admit that the team chemistry matters. And I'm like, yeah, I would just yeah of course the team chem of course the team chemistry matters, but we don't have that information right now. We don't have the full context of what it's going to look like when all the cards we don't know exist exist, and the world has had a chance to play with them. What we do have are analytics, and historically, the analytics have been really good at predicting what ends up being good, and stuff that is just the stuff that people know has been really good at getting liked by people during preview season because they already understand it. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with the context that's going to exist when all the cards are available. All right. So I think that if our bar is, does this make top eight of like some event, then I think that this is on the right side of the bar. Nope. Nope. That's a straw man. Yeah. I'm putting it against Bane Slayer Angel. I think that, I mean, I don't know if we're talking about Bane Slayer Angel in standard in the upcoming yep. year. Yeah. Um, I I would bet Bane Slayer Angel in standard in the upcoming year is the higher performing card. Um, if you're talking about larger formats, Bane Slayer Angel, it's not played as a four of main deck, but it continues to be included in in modern decks and 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 so I, I, it has been let's, for years. Let's see. Let's just see two months from now. If you would at least agree that Basari's lieutenant is at least in the same league as Bane Slayer Angel. All right. That'll be the. You can be the judge. All you have to do is just tell me yeah. that it's at least in the same league or higher. And uh, that'll be one side. Or if a couple months from now you say, yep, I've had a couple months with a straight face and a clear conscience. Uh, it's not in the same league as Bane Slayer Angel. I, I, will, I will try to be intellectually i don't think you'll have to try very hard i think it'll be pretty self-evident all right uh, uh so dude uh this is a totally different type of card but peer into the abyss four black 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 sorcery target player draws half their deck and then they uh lose half their life and you round up each time i was trying real hard to figure out uh how i would want to play this and when um it's very i mean it's very powerful, right? I was struggling to figure out when I would actually want to play this, despite the fact that its its power level is high, 
And I mean, well, power level like it has a high impact because I mean, it yeah, costs seven. it does a big thing, you know. It does that's, a big thing, that's but it costs a big thing I was thinking, amount. But like, I I don't even know how to evaluate its rate. Like this this doesn't kill anybody easily. Right? Well, I do. Okay, okay, so here's some ways to evaluate the rate. Let's start with um, the the boring way. The boring way is that there's a card that's four blue, blue, blue. Draw seven cards. Yep. Right. Got it. And then this card is much, much more than seven cards. Even if you don't have anything going on, if you're just playing it fair and straight up, you get incredible selection. Instead of draw seven cards, you're drawing 20 cards or whatever, right? And uh, you lose half your life. Now, in the matchups where you boarded in a draw seven, I mean, occasionally it would see main deck play, but for the most part, I'm guessing that you would be willing to pay half your life a pretty good chunk of the time. To, now, it's not like the draw seven. It's not like you weren't already doing such incredible things that it might be just win more, right? Like if all this did is let you draw half your deck, then the only way that it would be better than the draw seven straight up is in some kind of a context where either the format is so convoluted that your life total doesn't matter or you have a combo, right? Particularly if you have stuff that cares about the graveyard because you get to discard tons of cards. No, no, I think like the the seven mana at sorcery speed also has to be part of the evaluation. So I think that there's going to be situations like some sort of quicken or Teferi action allowing to, you to do this and then reclaim your mana is going to be important because otherwise you're just going to be discarding a bunch of those cards. Yeah, but you might just win the game immediately. Like like, uh, like a Grishel brand deck. Maybe. Like you could eat, you could be a Grishel brand deck type of thing. You could have a ton of graveyard interactions. You could have something that triggers every time you discard cards. You could just play this card when you have 10 mana and then immediately win the game. I don't know. You could just have cards to get a bonus every time you draw a card. There's a million different things that could be going on. But that's the that's not all that's going on with this card. And, and it's not just, by the way, the combos and stuff, because I think that blue has so many good card draw options that having a draw seven in black is a different experience, right? Yeah, Because if you're absolutely. playing a blue deck, you already have a million options to draw cards. But if you're playing like a black-white deck, it's a whole dimension to be able to, to have one copy of this somewhere, you know? Yeah, I think but there's that, a second part of this card that is crucial. Like, par- uh, not caring what your life total is, I think, has to be part of the equation for mm, you know, maybe if you're signing it in. No, not necessarily. That is a valuable thing, but it doesn't have to be part of the equation because there's the one more part that is the secret to this card. The mode we were just describing. I'm betting the people will be surprised how often that's the backup plan. <laughs> They're going to think that that's plan A and that it's a 90-10 that you're going to do that. But man, are you going to be surprised how often you dome your opponent for 10 and then attack and they're dead. How about twin casting it? That's Oh, wait, that doesn't work, right? Does it, well, they and then you attack separately. for five. Yeah. You're just not doing very much. But like... Imagine if you had a card that uh, punishes your opponent every time they draw a card. Like an right? Underworld Dreams type card? Right. Like if you have this with Underworld Dreams, they're dead. Or if you just have creatures, they're dead. I think this card is going to kill people a lot more than people realize. I don't think the card's going to see the, as much play because at the end of the day, just like the draw seven, it's an expensive card. There's plenty more. There's plenty of expensive options this one could prove to be good enough, but it's not like there aren't lots of other really good six and seven cost plays to begin with. What set is Underworld Dreams in right now? The the Return to Theros block. What? I mean, maybe that's just, you know, you, you just damage people with these two cards and the rest of your deck is just finding those pieces, enabling other card drawing type stuff, removal. That, that might be a thing. That's not bad at all. That's crazy. No, I don't think it's bad. Yeah, that's an incredible interaction. Yeah, like, and it's not like it's not like Underworld Dreams does nothing on its own, and it's not like Peer into the Abyss isn't like a great plan to set up your combo. You can peer yourself the first time on, you know, and then 
peer them the second time. It's super annoying to play against Underworld Dreams. Like if you're the kind of person who wants to just like draw a bunch of cards or whatever, like that sucks. I I actually I don't mind this at all. Like if it's just all no, like, and you know you even have Grim Tutor to set it up now. Grim Tutor the uh, high profile reprint. One black, black sorcery, search your library for a card, put in your hand, shuffle your deck, you lose three life. You even get value because then if you peer yourself, you're saving a life point. Patrick, do you think Grim Tutor is going to be a big player in standard? Uh, How big of a big player? I think it'll be a, uh, I think it'll get played. You think it's, so this card is restricted in vintage, is that correct? No. You just play four? Yeah, but like, who cares? Yeah, there's just so many things you can do in that format. Yeah, there's there's more. There are more demonic tutors and wheel of fortunes than you could possibly play. All right. Um, so it's a good card, but so, like a lot of things are good cards. Sign me up for at least trying peer into the abyss plus underworld dreams. I'm not so sure about grim tutor and standard. It seems like uh, you don't want to use it to set up your uh, peer into the abyss underworld dreams combo. I. I don't know. I I always have an imagination of what's going on around me, but maybe that's a limitation to me. Not a not a maybe that's a bug, not a feature in in how I approach things. I just can't I can't will myself to want to uh, pay three, take three, and hope I get my fourth turn. That's uh, <laughs> that's just how I look at it. I'm like I don't want to do that, and I mean maybe maybe the context will be great for it, uh, but I, I just I don't have any experience with that right now. All right, all right. Uh, completely different type of card, again, but Land of War Visionary, two and a green, two, two. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card, tap for green. So it's more or less an Elvish Visionary and a Land of War Elf stapled together. Yeah, this card is basically my dream, right? So instead of getting a basic land like I would with a Civic Wayfinder, I draw a card, which is sometimes better, sometimes a lot better, sometimes worse, but then I'm still two, two, get in there, Still 2-2. Two, two. I actually, I don't want to trade. I used to love just playing Civic Wayfinder and then trading for value. You can just trade with this, though. Yeah, but I don't because want you to know how I lose ex- my elf. Well, hold on. Maybe, but here's the thing. You know how you play the Civic Wayfinder and you threaten to trade? Yeah. But then maybe you don't actually trade because your opponent doesn't want to trade? Because <laughs> all I have is a stupid Civic Wayfinder. <laughs> but now, now they actually want to trade with your Civic Wayfinder. Yeah, because I have this sweet Land of War Visionary. Dude, and that's to say nothing of just Llanowar Visionary letting you play your uh, your Elder Gargaroth on turn four, you know, ahead of schedule. Patrick, this is a heretical question, so just just take it in the in the spirit in which it's asked. Is Llanowar Visionary a Titan? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, definitely. This is yeah. a Titan. Yeah. All right. I think that not only do I have an official favorite card from M21 this early in, in spoiler season, it's unlikely I will be moved from Land of War Visionary. <laughs> it is a Titan. It is a Civic Wayfinder. It is a Land of War Elf. No one will trade with it. Everyone will trade with it. It is all things to all all players. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of wild because... This set, like this card is a common, but Fierce Empath is an uncommon, which is just like half the size, doesn't tap for green, and instead of drawing a random card, you get a creature with converted mana cost six or greater, which don't get me wrong, that could be better in the right deck, and sometimes that's a combo piece, but like, if you're just playing the card straight up, it's not close between these two, Yeah, right? I mean, but back in the day when Fierce Empath was printed the first time, I think a lot of the times you were just getting, like, land cyclers or something with that. So, like, sometimes they were big, and sometimes you just used it to get another mana. <laughs> but, yeah, I, mean, I think Fierce Empath is going to be good, if and only if there's some sweet giant that you need to you need to pair it with in order to complete your puzzle. Uh, but I think that, man, Land of War Visionary is going to be... It's it's so fantastic. Do you remember when I played Land of War Visionary, or it's not Land of War Visionary? Sorry, when I played like Borderland Ranger instead of Bloodbraid Elf, and then later I played it <laughs> with, with Bloodbraid Elf. <laughs> they were friends. Uh, no, but I believe that that's the thing you would do. It's a thing I did. Uh, dude. Uh, so actually, on the note of two for ones, this isn't strictly a two for one, but it kind of can be. Uh, what do you think of Ritos de Pablo? 
uh, you know, not not sure what the English name will end up being, but it's the it's just black for an instant. Sacrifice a creature to draw two cards. Like one mana is a lot different than getting this card for two, right? Yeah, I mean, people played it for two. I mean, uh, this is an instant speed card, right? So yeah, like it's way less exciting if uh, if it's not an instant, but. You know, I think that you were the first person to point this out that like a pad, how like a pad to exile was often just going to be uh, a rampant growth for you. Like people waste their removal spell and then you're like, all right, path rampant growth. This is going to be similar feeling to that. I think one is way better than two. People were often willing to pay two. Um, so I think this is going to be a niche card, not a not a wildly staple card, but, you know, it'll be all right. I bet this card will surprise you with how much it gets played. Um, don't get me wrong, you know, two cost sack a uh, creature and draw two cards is not that good of a card, but, uh, there's a lot of things that get a lot better when they cost half as much mana. And specifically sacrificing something actually has text and standard, right? So this is going to combine with people who like, like the mechanic of sacrificing, right? So if you've got a particular three, three, that might ting someone as well as drawing some cards. Uh, what's your favorite of the two new black removal spells? I mean, one of them is a reprint, Grasp of Darkness, uh, BB, Instant, or a creature gets minus four, minus four, until on a turn. The other one uh, is the uncommon, it's the new upgrade to Smother that is, uh, it's just, uh, you know, it, Samir, I guess, yeah. I don't know what it'll be I in think English, but it's... saying Plunge, maybe. Kill, kill a creature or Planeswalker that costs three or less. So it's a Smother that also kills stuff like to fairy or a narset or whatever. So, um, obviously that's an upgrade. Obviously people were playing, uh, you know, two mana black removal spells just to kill three mana planeswalkers, uh, back when certain other three mana planeswalker was in print. Um, I think that both cards are going to be very good. Uh, I think that they're just going to have, I, I, I mean, I can totally imagine somebody who can cast grasp of darkness, playing a mix of Sumir and, and Grasp of Darkness. Uh, I don't think it's like strictly one's better than the other one. Um, I think, unfortunately, if you're going to plunge a, a Narset, you're, you're probably a little behind already on that. Um, plunging a Teferi is like kind of miserable because even though this is uh, an instant, yeah. It's an instant you have to wait and they might have already drawn. No, you don't necessarily have your mana open. Very often, like you just play a creature. Yeah. They play Bounce and then you go, okay, I mean, it's clearly a very good card, right? I mean, I played the not... Yeah, but which one's better, Grasp of Darkness or uh, or Sumir? I think Sumir is overall going to be better. I don't think that it's like whiz-bang, slam-dunk better, though. I do think that that easier cost, it does matter. Oh, I yeah. think that helps. I think that actually is the thing that, to me... Because I think there's going to be plenty of spots where Grasp gets the nod... But I think that you're right. In general, slight preference for Samir, but I do think that they both have the purpose and it's not whiz bang at all. And I also think like, I mean, there's going to be situations in both cases, like indestructible creatures versus not, but there's going to be cases where minus four, minus four isn't going to do it to a creature that doesn't have a high casting cost, right? Like you might have a gigantic, you know, token creature. You might have a gigantic creature with plus one, plus one counters on it, right? Um, that Sumir can take care of, uh, and Grasp of Darkness can't. But yeah. Then again, indestructible creatures. But Sumir, I well, think, a little bit. When your when your opponent plays their Basari Lieutenant because they're good, uh, if you're holding Sumir, you're like, oh no, I'm so dead. But if you grasp the Lieutenant with the trigger on the stack, they don't even get the two two. Exactly. Dude, you just wait. Basari's lieutenant, man. You just you just explained to me a hundred and first reason that it's not going to be that good. I hadn't even thought about it myself. <laughs> uh, we shall see. We shall see. Uh, last card uh, of the day. I think this card is wild. Teferi's Ageless Insight. Talk to me about Teferi's Ageless Insight, man. This is the two blue blue in ch- uh, legendary enchantment. And uh, if you would draw a card, except the first one you draw on each of your draw steps, draw two instead. So, um, wow, like, this card is, it's a specialist. First of all, it's legendary. Second of all, it's a specialist. 
Um, a specialist. What do you mean by that? Like yeah. It doesn't do anything if you just play it on its own. You've got to be building to you it a little gotta, bit. I mean, it's not necessarily a build around, but you've got to have a context oh, in it. your 60 that is friendly to this or it's not doing anything. Like, obviously, if you're playing a lot of opts, stuff like that, then this card is looking really, really powerful. Um, if your deck is otherwise unaffiliated, um, it's not doing that much at all. Uh, so I think, like, I don't know. It's, it doesn't do anything the first turn that it comes out unless you've got an enormous amount of mana. Um, I don't know. It's not, this one's not singing to me, Patrick. Uh, so maybe, maybe it doesn't do anything. Maybe it does, though, right? Like, if you play Teferi on turn three, it might be the case that on turn four you get to bounce something and then draw two cards. That is uh, a very cool thing to do. Uh, but one of the places where it really shines, you see, it, it's tempting to look at a card like this and be like, okay, how many cards do I have to draw before I've got my money? If you draw three cards, you know, it's, you, it's arguable you got about your money, but if it was spread out, you're still probably behind, so you really need to draw four cards to be ahead of the game. But here's the thing. It's, it's easy to be like, uh, maybe it's just win more because I already drew four extra cards. What do I need four more cards for? But the cards help beget each other. Like When you opt and draw two, it helps find you more stuff so that you can draw more extra cards and draw cards from this also. But it's not just draws that this buffs. It's also loots. So, for instance, if you have Teferi, Master of Time, uh, Teferi, Master of Time, among many other abilities, has plus one, draw a card, then discard a card. And be this, uh, if you have Teferi, Master of Time, and Teferi's Ageless Insight, now Teferi's ability is plus one to draw two cards and then discard one card. So you're actually changing a loot into a catalog, which is a lot more than double. Not only that, but Teferi can be used twice, you know, once on your turn, once on your opponent's turn. So you're actually getting two extra cards, and you get to look five cards deep a turn cycle. Right? Like, that's that's an incredible amount of digging. You're not even spending any extra mana. And that's just Teferi. There's other things you could be doing as well, but think about how insane this card is with anything that lets you loot. Um, you know, assuming that you know, you're able to deploy a bunch of these expensive engine type cards. It well, some of them are cheap, like Jeskai Elder. Jeskai Elder is the one in a blue one two prowess reprint that when it deals combat damage to a player, you can draw a card if you do discard a card. If you have Jeskai Elder, I mean Jeskai Elder is not that far off. Like that's not like it's an oh, embarrassing I think card. Jeskai Elder is certainly a playable card, right? It right. Did, and then if you have this play card the first in play, time that we thought it might have. I, you know, it was fringe. It got you know, occasionally would show up in some Jeskai decks, but it wasn't very popular at all. But if you put Teferi's Ageless Insight with Jeskai Elder, you're really doing it. What about Teferi's Ageless Insight with Jeskai Ascendancy? Well, you're probably not going to miss if you've got both of them. Like, I have a hard time imagining you miss if both of those permanents are in play. I think you get them. You get them right then and there. I think it was a good game. What about if you're playing a deck with a lot of brainstorms, ponders, and preordains, and this card? Yeah, that's what I said, Patrick. If you're playing Worse, deck... Edge of Autumn, Street Wraith, uh, Mishra's Bobble. Imagine you're playing a deck with all these Edge of Autumn, Street Wraiths, Mishra's Bobbles, Ops, Brainstorms, Thought Scours, whatever. Do you take four mana off to play Teferi's Aegis Insight? Because that deck sounds like it's got a lot of velocity whether or not you've, you've invested this four mana. Now, if you well, do, you're probably not going to miss. You're probably going to go get whatever it was that you were going to get, and maybe that means this card is going to be staple in Vintage. I don't know. Um, I, don't think, I don't think it's powerful enough to be a staple in Vintage, but it's possible. I don't think so, though. I, I think it's more likely that you just need a slightly lower powered format for this to be a kill you immediately type of card. But, um, dude, this card is so good with the Algos bargain though. Can I just say, but there is a <laughs> separate thing, which is, uh, Teferi's ageless insight can just be used straight up. You can just play a deck that has cycling cards. If you have this in play, you cycle, you are doing, it. you are doing it. The limit is only your mana and your imagination. 
It is the original TSR at that point. <laughs> Dude, Dungeons would you agree this card is gonna show up if only for cycling? Uh, I mean, I think, I think like now that you you say that, maybe I'm like in a Teferi's Aegis Insight with some kind of not just cycling, but also like jump starts so that I can get rid of my extra Teferi's Aegis Insights that I drew with all my extra cards. I, I don't think you're going to even need to get rid of it. You can if you want, but you're going to draw so many cards, hand size will take care of it for you. Yeah, and then I'm just going to get them with like the, the, uh, rw2 instant <laughs> i mean you could you could that. you could also just get him with one one flyers there's a lot of things oh getting do. him with one one flyers is all right i wouldn't even yeah. like tap in some mana into that enchantment if i'm on that in that game definitely I don't, I don't mind that that's a deck i think that's a legit that deck. Is a deck that is so a deck because especially if you've got like second draw triggers like this just gives you second draw triggers on your opponent's turn very easily yeah. That's not oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. I think you've convinced me to burn a lot of wild cards in the in the last 30 seconds. Dude, if you I peer will get no yourself, return of these wild cards. If you peer yourself, you'll get like 24 cards instead of 23. All right. I'll uh, see you next week. Bye bye. In life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge, it's a jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis please. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind. Had to find a way not to lose my mind. Trapped in a vault with